You all, the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, Dean Rhonda Gonzalez, who we're super happy is able to come tonight, and she's gonna start things off. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for that uh, warm beginning. I am Rhonda Gonzalez. I am the Dean of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. And I hope that you're here for this important occasion and remember to Yom Hashua. And I'm going to begin here um, with reading the names of 10 victims of the Holocaust. And um, so please join me in remembering. Yusuf Talmachi from Chinzia, murdered at Book at age five. David Steinowitz from Warsaw, murdered at Treblinka in 1943 at age eight. Ivolga Winterstein from Neupest, murdered at Auschwitz in 1943 at age six. Frida Bain from Warsaw, murdered at Majanek in 1943 at age five. Dorte Hirsch, from Berlin, murdered at Auschwitz in 1944 at age nine. Violette Levy from Marseille, murdered at Auschwitz in 1944 at age two. Salomea Weiss from Lvov, murdered in Lvov in 1942 at age seven. Belashka Gershengorn from Kiev, murdered at Babi Yar, in 1941 at age three. Bernard Abraham from Amsterdam, murdered at Auschwitz in 1942 at age one. Marilka Eck from Lvov, murdered at Belzec at age nine. We remember remembering members. This incredible exhibit showcases the power of survival and witness and the important work of our D DU Holocaust Awareness Institute. Now I'd like to introduce the director for the Center for Judaic Studies, Dr. Adam Abner. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Gonzalez, and thank you all for, for coming tonight. Uh, we are reading names of survivors, just the Dean and I will do it, we're doing this in participation. It's a worldwide project. Uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum does it. Yad Vashem uh, does it, sponsors it. And so we're participating to make that uh, part of our global reach. We're reaching out to do that. So I'll do that. And should you want to read some names as well, uh, obviously, we're not all going to get the pronunciation perfectly right. And that's OK. But to feel like you are participating, we are going to have a uh, place set up outside for you to do that. So if you'd like to find Selena, who's right there with the camera, or Ingrid, who's right there, they can help you get situated for the filming if you'd like to do that. And then we'll post it and be part of that worldwide project. I think it's really great that, that we're doing that. So I will start by doing uh, that. Uh, Isik Forkash from APSA, murdered in Auschwitz in 1941, age one. Sally Aronovich from Chernovitz, murdered at Mogilev Podorsky, 1942, age eight. Miko Tabo from Saloniki, murdered at Auschwitz, age four. Hershey Ziegler from Lodz, murdered at Treblinka, 1944, age one. David Weinrib, Dabrova Gornishka, murdered at Auschwitz, 1943, age 10. Salomo Brezhniak from Plishin, murdered at Majdanek in 1943, age six. Isidore Goldstein from Sofia, murdered at Dachau, age eight. Smell Moskovich from Mihailovich, murdered at Majdanek in 1942, age 10. Andras Unger from Upest, murdered at Auschwitz, 1944, age eight. Nelia Jukulsa from Odessa, murdered at Odessa, 1943, age five. Uh, to everyone, his name, and we try to recall their memories. Uh, I'm here for a brief time to talk to you. I'm not gonna 
belabor the point, but I do want to let you know that we are now a rejuvenated Holocaust Awareness Institute, and we have a lot of projects we are doing. We have long been doing the Marcus Lecture, the Marcus Memorial Lecture, uh, in memory of Fred Marcus, that Audrey Marcus, many of you know her, has helped us set up in the Marcus family. That is every fall, and that's been going on strong even through COVID, and we hope that some of you will attend in the fall. We also are trying to do some sort of event every quarter. We have three quarters at DU, academic quarters, in the winter and the spring. Already this winter, we've held the first in-person Holocaust training uh, education program for teachers face-to-face -face that I think the state has had in the last two years. And right now, we have this wonderful exhibit thanks to the vision of Michael Feiner, who's we're happy to have with us tonight, who came to me and said, I have these books, I have these photos, these are amazing, Nick Docals is amazing, why don't we do something? And I said, all right, let's do it. So thanks to my fantastic staff of Ingrid and Selena, truly, I could probably, I could put on my pants, but maybe that's about it without them. Uh, they're, they're here uh, tonight, and, and you should really, they, they make things happen. Uh, in this period of time between the two ends of the holidays of Passover, that's called Cholomoid. That's a period of uh, joy. It's neither holiday nor the normal weekday world. And you're actually not supposed to, uh, I'm, I'm stepping on the rabbi's toes here, but I, you're not actually supposed to mourn during this period. But so I kind of see this as neither full mourning nor full celebration. So I'm kind of pitching it in that in-between space where we can remember and we can also look forward. And that's what this exhibit is here tonight. These are people whose, we are have these wonderful portraits here, whose stories are significant. They're significant not only just to their families, but to all of us because we can learn something from them. And what we are doing at the Holocaust Awareness Institute and the Center for Judaic Studies more broadly is really pioneering a new educational platform. It is called Survival and Witness. It's right here, you can pick up a flyer on your way out. You are also welcome, by the way, to pick up a book on your way out. If we need more books, we have them because Michael Fire's been generous enough to give them to us. And Nick Del Calzo, the photographer, has also agreed to sign them uh, with his name as well. Please, take one home with you. Survival and Witness is the way that we plan to link from the past into the future. I am uh, you know, in my 50s, and I learned from my parents who learned from their parents. My daughter's out there right now. She's the next generation. I have students out there, my students take classes with me. They're the next generation. We need to figure out a way to keep this going, this knowledge, this awareness going, not simply as a kind of historian that I am, and the dean is also a historian, is not just for the sake of history, but because we believe that there is value in learning about this, learning about these lives, in the hope, maybe naive, but without hope, what do you got? Hope that we can, for the going into another gen, couple generations of the 21st century, that's what our project is doing. It is a web-based platform. It is a web-based platform for education. It is there telling the stories of people whose lives were ruptured their stories of survival, and the lives they made for themselves afterward. Those are the survivor stories. They are no longer with us to a great extent, and because of age, they're fading. So we need to be the vessels of memory for the future. We have people here who are second generation survivors. We have people here who are third generations who bear witness to that witness, and the story we are telling is to enable to carry that forward to another generation who won't have the opportunity, like many of you did, to hear the survivors speak, to have that immediacy, that's not going to be here anymore. So projects like what we are doing, projects like Triumphant, uh, Triumphant Spirit and Nick's photos, these are what enable us to take the memory into the future. And so the fact that you were all here tonight is also a great deal, is a great part of that. Um, I will invite you in a moment to continue to look around, to continue to read, and to talk to some of the people who really made this happen. And, and so I would invite up front first, Michael, would you come up? 
you might we're gonna we're gonna do a little quick interview and Nick's gonna come up. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on up, Nick. And Renee is gonna come up. I warned them that we're gonna do this, but I think that this is a way that you get a little bit of, of the story of how this happened. We need a little bit of, of oral tradition to learn how this do, do you want chairs or are you okay for a few minutes? Okay. You alright? Okay. So let me let me introduce. This is my uh, Michael Feiner, Denbury businessman, philanthropist, very involved in the Jewish community. Renee Rockford works for Jewish Colorado and is a wonderful uh, writer. And Nick Del Calzo, who's a uh, local photographer, and this is his fourth. Uh, you told me it was your fourth career as a portrait right. photographer. So we've got three people here who have worked on this, and I want to address just a question or two to each of them, so you get to hear how they came to be involved in this, and maybe it'll resonate with you. And then when you're circulating around the room, if you don't know Nick or Renee or Michael, you can maybe chat with them, ask them a question too. I think that that's a nice way. We, get to know. It has, we haven't been able to meet in public for very long, right? So this is a good way we can get to know one another, those people you don't know. So um, let me thank Michael, first of all. You came to me with this idea this to put this up to get this out in the open. I know it's been exhibited before, and I know I wanted to let, ask you if you would tell everyone how you came to be affected by these portraits, how you came to know about them, and why you, you know, decided to, to what is essentially publish this book, which is Triumphant Spirit, available over there, and what, why this is important to you. I mean, you're from here. You're, you're not from Europe. What, 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 what happened? The, the short story is that I had the opportunity to come here in 1981, I joined a company now called MDC. And one of the co-founders was a Holocaust survivor named Emil Hett. And over the 10 years that I was there, uh, almost every day we had lunch together. And I probably learned more uh, than I ever would have imagined. And I'm very honest to admit that growing up in Cleveland, uh, in a very Jewish environment, uh, we're a part of the community uh, were immigrants. Uh, I guess nobody in that time frame, in the 60s, early 60s, talked about the Holocaust. So I was as uh, unaware, as naive, uh, as anybody. And these stories that he was reluctant to tell, but uh, we were so close, uh, they told me uh, stories of unimaginable horror. And uh, just a man of great determination, great knowledge, after the war, uh, he had an opportunity, actually had written a book, and Sidney Sheldon uh, wanted him to come to Hollywood, but he ended up working uh, in the uh, displacement camps where he met his wife who was doing the same thing. And uh, the skill that he had that was so meaningful is that these emotionally and physically uh, impaired people, he could speak their language because he spoke 10, 12 languages. And it was more comforting versus the goodwill, UN, uh, people from America, uh, from the joint, uh, they didn't speak those languages. So uh, he did that for several years, had lung issues, and was brought to Denver. And I think that uh, I'm also involved in National Jewish, uh, but there's a lot of stories that tie to that. At any rate, over 40 years ago, we had the pleasure of working with Nick's uh, uh, PR firm, and uh, we got to know each other, but he got to know Emil better. And he will tell you uh, how it affected him, and then an event led him to do the book. And uh, later on, uh, after I left MDC and pursued other business opportunities, I stayed very close to uh, Emo. And um, as the survivors were passing on, he said, it's really important to tell the story, uh, continue to have these stories told. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know how you could produce a book better uh, the genius of Nick and Renee, it, it's the momentum. Uh, I, I've been, I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of people and presenting them this book, and they see the cover and they're blown away. I mean, it is as powerful as any photograph that could have ever been taken, and then when you understand what's behind it, it's even more powerful. At any rate, uh, somewhere uh, as the years were moving on, uh, and Nick ended up doing several other books, one on uh, uh, war heroes, uh, 
uh, Medal of Honor, which is a tremendous uh, achievement. Um, I felt it was important to continue, and we worked on an arrangement uh, whereby uh, we would have access to the books, the pictures, and uh, for many years I've struggled trying to find better access. Uh, I send them every time I read about a Holocaust survivor, uh, I send a copy of the book with a note basically ending how lucky we are to live in this great country. Uh, but um, I think I, I'm really grateful uh, to uh, Rabbi Strer and the Federation and DU. I think we're just taking off, and I think with what's happening, uh, it's funny because I just brought a magazine that is discussing that the new wave in Jewish education is Holocaust education. I don't think it could be more relevant with what we see. Uh, I can't even imagine how the millennials think, uh, but they take the freedom for granted as we probably did. And with what's going on in Ukraine, uh, maybe there's a refresher course of how lucky we are. And I think these stories are a reminder and just a, a, a further you know, uh, need to continue to understand our history. So. Thank you very much. You're, you're good up here, Michael. <laughs> no wonder he, he's a teacher. He, he gives me homework and I read it, so it's good. Uh, now let me turn to, to Nick Del Caso, who's the photographer. You can maybe, you want to show, point to the, the photo there of, of Emil. Uh, uh, oh, which one? Um, yeah. Emil, where's Emil? We have We have that? Up. That's Emil Gold. That's my dad. Oh, sorry. So that's the cover. That's the cover. Yes. Sorry. So Nick, you told me a story earlier about how you got involved in this project, and you mentioned where's Linda. I told Linda, Linda Raper, who is also I did not know this until this evening, instrumental in the project. Uh, Nick, tell us how you came to take these photos. What what happened? Because, you know, it's not obvious that you would, coming from Denver, take these photos. All right, you want me to be brief? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, the short version of it is that um, Linda was building a home and asked if I would I'd like to live with her, and uh, it was a special deal. In any event, uh, while the house was being built, I put a pack on my back and went to Europe to do portraits of my extended family in, in, um, in Paris, uh, Italy, and Belgium. And I spent three months doing that. But when I was on a train going to Munich, I, my eyes caught the list of the individual, individual stations, and I saw Dachau. And I said, I have to stop there overnight. Because I had studied the Holocaust as a, a, a high school student, and again, in college. So I did, it was happened to be uh, Halloween night, by the way. So the next morning, I, with one roll of film, I shot a roll of film of brick and mortar, got on the train, went to Munich, did my portraits of my extended family. And when I returned, I made some prints what I had photographed, and I was in my dark room, and I made a couple of prints, and Linda came down, and she said, uh, Nick, I'm, I'm going to go to King Supers. Is there anything you need? I said, uh, no. And then she pointed to the prints on the table and said, what are those? And I said, that's the stuff I shot at Dachau. And um, she's a very polite person. What she said in a strong voice, which I never heard before and since, and she said, "Will you promise me you'll take those images to the Jewish Community Center?" And I said, "What are you kidding? There's no people in these photographs. I want to, I want to do, do shots of the people in, 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 uh, that survived it." So she said, "But promise me that you'll go to the Jewish Community Center." I did, and I showed them my work. They wanted to do a show, and I said. I, there aren't any human beings in the photographs. So I was, I asked for some names, and that was the first portrait I did. As, and I'm looking the, the one that's on the cover of the book. Oh, sure. What's that? The one that's on the cover of the book. The one on the cover of the book, right. That's right. 
So as a result of that, um, I came back and, and determined that something was happening. I wanted to commit myself to this. Linda left her job and we took equipment and carried 13 states around the United States and asking for Holocaust survivors and recorded their messages. I mean, those are on tape, which you have, and uh, did the portraits. And after that, as we were going around, people would say, well, what's going to happen with this body of work? Uh, are you going to do a book? And I said, no, I just went to do a show. But you must do a book. That was at the end of it. That's what really happened. And so. that's an amazing story. Bear with me for a second. So, Nick, you grew up here? No. Where'd you grow up? Uh, foreign country. <laughs> foreign country. <laughs> no, you want to know which one? Sure. New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> you from South Jersey? Uh, no, North Jersey. I'm South Jersey. <laughs> no, no, North Jersey. Atlantic City. Okay. <laughs> so, North Jersey is definitely a foreign country. So, but Nick went to a high school where he learned enough about the Holocaust, where when he's traveling through Europe, Dachau rings a bell as a place. He gets off on a whim and starts taking photographs. Those photographs are then seen by Linda, who says, you got to go to the Jewish Community Center. He goes, because he's, he's a good guy, he listens. And he goes and he gets this done, and now we have a book. And now the book is out. And now this is only because of what you get in a school. That's what education can do. We don't know where that's going to end up. One, Nick, one, one sure. comment. Sure, please. If she had told me and insisted to take this to the Jewish Community Center, I wonder what my life would be today as a result of that. So, so thank you, Linda. Linda is the person that you ought to be applauded. <laughs> And I want to have Renee up here. Renee Rockford works for Jewish Colorado. You've, you've been a writer, I think, in a PR marketing for a long time, right? Am I remembering that correctly? And now she works for Jewish Colorado. So it's maybe, you know, more, it, maybe it's more understandable than you would be, but how did you meet Nick and come up with these texts? And what did you have to do? I understand that you listened to all the tapes that now Michael has, that Nick and Linda made, and then how did you condense all this material? Well, I knew Nick from, I was working in television at the time, and Nick was working in PR, and um, one conversation led to another. He needed a writer for all of the approximately 100 stories, and my dad was a Holocaust survivor, so in many ways I spoke the language, I understood, um, and it made it easier for me to speak to people. But Nick and Linda had a very tight timeline for producing the book. Nick had a printing date in Korea over Christmas, I believe. Um, and he wanted 92 biographies in 60 days. And he asked me to write the book. Um, so I listened to the audio tapes. Many of these survivors had written their own books, so I would read what they had written. Memoirs, different newspaper articles, and Linda and Nick wanted each story told in 600 words. So I worked and worked and worked, and then Linda was actually the editor, and, um, and she would help fine tune it. So in 60 days, I wrote 92 biographies. I had, um, I had a wee, two wee children at home at the time, and, and uh, one who was there then is here now. So. Um, I would tuck them in at eight o'clock and I would write till two in the morning for 60 days and completed the book and then Nick took it to Korea and printed it. It has been, it was certainly a labor of love. My father's in the book. I knew Helen uh, in BBYO growing up. Um, and I think the really the honor and the responsibility to tell the stories and to keep telling the stories has been um, a very meaningful part of it. Most of these people, as you said, are no longer with us, so the obligation to continue to tell the story has, um, has never run more true. Thank you. Yeah, so this is really amazing. By the way, she was recognized with 
top award for her writing. <laughs> An award winning writer. <laughs> exactly. An award winning writer. So this is, I mean, this is a partnership. It took editors and photographers and business people and PR people to produce what we've got here that allows us to honor these people's legacy. A legacy of their lives before, their stories of survival, and they are the unusual ones because they survived, and then the lives that they built for themselves afterwards. So take a moment, take some time if you haven't circulated and read all the text, please do, do so. The reason that we are able to have this event is because of generosity of lots of people. Some of them are here, some of them are not here, uh, who, who helped us out over time, and I do very much appreciate that because it is meaningful, and our students do get exposed to important material in this way. And this also allows us to distribute these books at every Holocaust educational uh, event that we hold. And we hope for many years to come to be able to have this as an annual exhibit. And we'll have, there are many more portraits than what are here that are in Michael's collection. And as long as Michael uh, is gracious enough to loan them, we'll feature new ones. And we want to have this up because every year, different students are going to cycle through here. And we don't know who is going to get exposed to this man's material, and then one day take a train somewhere, see a sign, get off, and then influence other people's worlds. So thank you very much. Come, have a look. Thank you.